When I find myself unable to sleep at night, I usually turn to something a bit unconventional. I will scroll through the top submissions on the No Sleep Reddit, and here I will bury myself in the short stories. I become enthralled in the worlds of the characters. For me, it's blissful. As a kid, I did my best to track down any scary story collections I could find. I would read these stories and try to retell them to the classmates at school strictly for memorization. I was never a great storyteller, and I likely butchered these stories. However, I built friendships as we all brought our stories to the playground and exchanged them in the hope of scaring our friends. This is a large part of why I seek these stories now. They take me back. One of the first stories to both hurl me back in time and craft a beautifully dark world was Baraska. It was a masterfully written lengthy tale originally posted in July of 2015 to the No Sleep Reddit. Each section of the four-part story would go on to be awarded Reddit gold, and the author C.K. Walker won Scariest Story of 2015. All this praise was warranted. Upon discovering this story in my sophomore year of high school, I had to share it with as many people as would listen. This resulted in me being repeatedly exposed to the many plot points and emotional rides in the twisting tale. I absolutely adored the story and its initial four installments. Baraska's first part hooked me in right away. The protagonist, Sam, prefaces the story with this. It's a long story, but one you've never heard before. This story is about a place that dwells on the mountain. A place where bad things happen. And you may think you know about the bad things. You may decide you have it all figured out, but you don't. Because the truth is worse than monsters or men. This appears to pave the way for the standard setting of a creepypasta, or scary story. Of course, a mountain is an unfamiliar location and is scary, but the surface level attempts to predict what would unfold could not have been further from the truth. The initial installment reads much like a Goosebumps book, or something else childish. In the beginning, Sam is young and moves to an unfamiliar neighborhood. The author capitalizes on the reader looking back on their youth and relating to the child's decisions and almost comical fears that Sam and his friends share in their adventures. This portion of the story reminds me of the countless nights I would have trouble sleeping due to just finishing a scary story from my collection of books. But towards the end, the sort of nostalgic spell is broken and the story looks to get serious as some link between Sam's missing sister and the triple tree is established. This is beautiful because the reader has no reason to assume anything but a supernatural link. The author sets us up to fail, which makes the story's twists all the more shocking. Part 2 gives way to a time skip. Sam and his friends are now sophomores in high school. This is a key time in one's life, much like the age of innocence the children had in the first part. This is a time of understanding and figuring out life. This is why it works so well. Slotting yourself into the mind of a teenager, it is easy to understand why Sam still pushes so hard. He feels real pain because his sister is gone. He fights for answers even though he knows he may hit dead ends. This sort of hard-headed, try-until-you-make-it mentality makes the reader gloss over details that would later make themselves important. This is why it works so well to have the time skip. It follows the tone of the story. The monsters in the closet are gone, and now a seemingly senile old man, Mr. Prescott, talks of something far darker. Being an old man, his speech comes off as pointless and unbelievable. I certainly skipped over it, as the words didn't connect in my brain. Like Sam, I chalked it up to a crazy old man. The author's way to accurately portray such a wide variety of emotions helps sell the story. The tone of the third part stays interesting. It shifts to a thoughtful and emotionally hurt Sam and Kyle. Together they want to save their friend Kimber, but start to realize they will have to do it alone. This gets the reader to begin to connect the dots and look back on what they've read. As it becomes clear that something involving the police is going on, the readers are forced to reevaluate every reaction between Sam and his father and the police in general. The audience feels for Sam and Kyle, as it's them versus the world, in a sense. The feeling of hopeless longing so common through teenage years makes the evolved characters of Sam and Kyle work so well. 
The ending of the third part leaves the reader feeling defeated, but without answers. The cliffhanger fuels a want for more to the story. It has so many question marks surrounding it that we are drawn to the fourth part. In true no sleep fashion, the fourth part is not some happy fairy tale ending. Kyle and Sam do the best that their adolescent minds can manage. They come to have their delicate world shaken and eventually crushed by the severity of the situation. The story ends with the closure of a transcription of the original letter Kimber's mom wrote before her suicide. This fills in the gaps and serves to explain what Sam and Kyle saw in their mad rush to rescue their friend. It does not leave the reader with a warm and fuzzy feeling, but instead opens their eyes and takes their breath away all at once. Wow, was all I could say upon completing it. The details that are passed over upon first reading the story smash back into focus. Things like why there were so many red-haired children or Mira's infertility now make sense. Even more so, though, the depth of the story was unbelievable. It's written so beautifully that the reader is unaware any of this is going on, and at best comes to suspect drugs until the very end. It is rare that a story has such an original idea that the entire ending comes across as unbelievable. All predictions are foiled. The realism aspect is also top-notch. While stories on No Sleep are generally written to at least resemble the real world to some degree, uh, it's uncommon to find a story that is so powerfully scary while remaining entirely in the real world. Kyle's quote, We're living in hell, Drisking. It's hell in our own reality is fitting. Amusingly, many stories try to create a hellish atmosphere, and some even visit the realm of hell, but this story reminds us that the scariest places are right where we live. Baraska serves as a tale of growth and understanding, and shows us the fears of the real world. This is why it so resonated with me. As Sam began, we may think we have it all figured out, but we never do. As a soon-to-be freshman in college, this is more true now than ever. The ending was satisfying, in the sense that these kids grew up and in their short lives experienced more than most of us will in our time on Earth. They sure as hell didn't have it all figured out, and they knew the truth was scary, but they pushed through it and gave it their all. Baraska was no Disney story, but it was a masterpiece in its own right, with a depressingly dark lesson to be learned. The scariest parts of life are just out of our view or just behind our backs.